Um, let's get started. We have a terrific panel here today. And we have today who I consider to be the rock stars in the world of parental alienation. Dr. Jennifer Harmon and Dr. Demosthenes Lorandos. Dr. Harmon received her PhD in social psychology from the University of Connecticut in 2005 and has been an associate professor of psychology at Colorado State University since that time. She has also held a joint appointment at the University of Colorado School of Public Health for several years. For over two decades, Dr. Harmon's scientific research has been externally funded and has focused on a variety of public health problems that have direct policy implications, such as HIV AIDS prevention, maternal and sexual health, nutrition and domestic violence in national and international context. She has published over 35 peer reviewed scientific papers in high impact social health, psychology journals, testing basic and applied research questions, published a textbook on research methods and has published critical papers and methods in applied research settings and has published numerous books and chapters on the topic of intimate relationships, violence, and in particular, the topic of parental alienation. The study of parental alienation as a form of family violence has been her primary research focus for almost 10 years. And a large proportion of her study and her scholarly work is in this area. She teaches social psychology and research methods to large number of undergraduates and graduate students and has supervised and mentored nearly a dozen graduate students who have obtained their doctorates, many of whom are also now in academic positions or higher levels of government agencies, such as the CDC. She serves on the board of directors for the Parental Alienation Study Group, serves as a reviewer for some of the top psychology journals in her field, and has recently finished a term as an action editor for the journal, Personality and Social Psychology Bulletin. Dr. Demosthenes Lorandos is the first generation American of Greek and Australian heritage. He is licensed at the highest level as a psychologist in California and Michigan. He is also a trial attorney and is admitted to practice law in California, New York, Michigan, District of Columbia, Tennessee, and many federal district courts, the second, sixth, ninth, 11th federal circuits, as well as the United States Supreme Court. Dr. Lorando studied science at the New School of for Social Research in New York and took his first job as a psychology trainee in 1965. In five decades, as a practicing clinical and forensic psychologist, Dr. Lorandos has carried out original research and published both quantitative and qualitative studies in the journals of the behavioral sciences. He has served as an evaluator and expert witness hundreds of times in the United States, Canada, and in Europe as well. Dr. Lorando studied law at the University of Detroit and has been publishing as a legal scholar for over three decades. As a trial lawyer, he has litigated closely contested cases in 30 of the United States and is regularly asked to teach forensic science and legal advocacy in the continuing education programs for law and forensic sciences. In addition to being a peer reviewer for journals of law and science, Dr. Lorandos is an executive editor, contributing editor or co-author of five books describing the intersection of science and law. His two volume work with forensic psychologist, the late Dr. Terence Campbell, cross-examining experts in the behavioral sciences is now in its 20th year of continual publication and annual updates. Dr. Lorandos has authored or co-authored numerous chapters in professional texts concerning the intersection of science and law and has published many peer reviewed studies in this important topic and area. He's the lead author and managing editor of the book, Litigator's Handbook of Forensic Medicine, Psychiatry and Psychology. He is a 
president of the forensic psychology consulting company, psychlaw.net, PLLC in the United States. He can be reached at www.psychlaw.net. Dr. Harmon and Dr. Lorandos, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for helping to facilitate this, Ashish. My pleasure. Let's start uh, with your paper. The paper titled Allegations of Family Violence in Court, How Parental Alienation Affects Judicial Outcomes, published in the journal Psychology, Public Policy and Law, published by the American Psychological Association, uh, recently published in 2020. Can you tell us what made you write about this topic? How did you come to it? Well, um, we really wanted to, we, we, had, we had originally read the paper that was written by Joan Meyer and her team. Um, that was, it was a report that was read, published in 2019. And when we read it, we, we were concerned about some of the hypotheses that were tested and the findings that were reported. And we were concerned that based on some of the, the little detail that was provided in the report that maybe it wasn't done correctly. That was initially what I, what I kind of looked at. I was like, this doesn't make any sense. I don't know how they actually did this study when I read it. And as a scientist and somebody who reviews lots and lots of papers for journals and other things, unless I know how someone did something and came to the conclusions that they are writing about, I can't have a lot of faith in what they're reporting. And so I initially reached out uh, to Dr. Lorandos um, with some of my concerns about the paper. And I said, these are really important questions that are being asked, but I'm not entirely convinced yet that these were the right methods or the right way of going about asking those questions or answering them. And so we decided to meet and chat about it. And, and that, that's sort of what led to us deciding to um, move ahead and do our own independent test of, of the hypotheses because they are very important hypotheses that um, or sets of findings that are concerning and we wanted to make sure that that, that could be replicated. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask you what were the red flags which led you to approach Dr. Lorandos when you first read the findings? Well, as somebody who's done a lot of work in the public health area, the biggest red flag for me was that the findings were being used to try to change law and, and policies based on one study. And we would never do that in another field of study. Um, you know, we would replicate. And, and in fact, an axiom of all good science is replication. Um, you know, for example, if if somebody did a study on the COVID vaccine on 500 people, frankly, I wouldn't want to go get the COVID vaccine unless it was tested on more people and other populations and retested and retested and retested until it was finally met approval that it worked. And usually when you have a study that has very good methods, very strong findings um, that are concerning, usually you would advocate for a um, government agency to allocate a line of funding to further investigation of that and solicit proposals from other independent research teams in order to test those hypotheses. That's what you would do in HIV prevention research, cancer research, all these other public health problems. And what concerned me when I was reading the paper is that the conclusions were being argued to warrant major legislation change on one study. And I, that really was the biggest red flag for me. That's a big leap to take from one study. I think it's dangerous to do that on one study. Um, I think it's really important to replicate and replicate as often as possible using different methods, different populations, different approaches. And then if we can show that, it, that those findings are replicable, then we can start to feel like we're actually capturing accurately what's happening. You can't do that on one study. And so that's why I reached out to, that was the red flags for me. And Demos, I could turn it over to you. You had, you had other issues that you were concerned with. Yeah. Right. Yes. Lorando, so what was your response when Dr. Harmon turned to you for your input? Well, the, the context is particularly important. 
And uh, just seven months ago, I was privileged to talk to an audience for the uh, special webinar series on parent-child contact problems that AFCC put on. And uh, uh, I was uh, one of the folks that was invited to uh, present some research for the reviewers, uh, uh, the editors of the special issue that came out in uh, April, the editors, uh, Professor Nicholas Bala and psychologist Barbara Jo Fiddler. And I talked, I talked about what brought me to do this work uh, in June, on June 18th of 2020. And, and I think it's important to talk about uh, who does the research, what their background is, what their orientation is to science. And that's partially what we wanted to talk about today because anyone, we made sure that anyone could get this paper for free, thanks to a gracious donation. And you can read the paper, but, but knowing who we are and what our orientation is, I think is particularly important. So, you know, when I get a chance, I'd like to talk about that. Sure. So let's talk about the topic of your research, the paper, allegations of family violence in court. I mean, as any family law practitioner knows, or judges and everyone in the family court setting, the concepts of domestic violence and parental alienation come over again and again. I mean, Dr. Lorandos, your research and study in this area of thousands of cases in American courtrooms have led you to write a lot about this. But can you tell us so how did you come to this particular topic of intersection of family violence and alienation? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> it's important when you read a, a work like the paper that, that this, this presentation is about to understand who are the folks that are doing it. And, and I want to talk about that a little bit because with apologies to uh, Donna Haraway or Miranda Fricker and, uh, you know, and a, and a feminist epistemologist. And I think Professor Harmon will kick me if I go any further into that. <laughs> it's important to know in the politics of science, it's important to know who's doing the research. What are their, what's their background? What's their orientation? Uh, Professor Naomi uh, Oreskes uh, and her co-author uh, Eric Conway put out a wonderful book in 2010 called Merchants of Doubt. And she described, when I talked to her about that, and she, she described the politics of science, she's a historian of science at Harvard. When I talked to her about that, she, she and I were discussing the, his, the modern history of science and who does it and how that impacts uh, the, the uh, research findings. And she pointed me to the, to the, Campbell, uh, the, to the Campbell father and son study, the, the China study, with a terrific description of how research is done and how that can impact it. So, so it's important, since I've got this long record of talking about uh, parental alienation and family violence, that, that, that the people who don't know me hear something about me. And then Professor Harmon can explain all the methodology. So, so as you said, I've been a psychologist of one kind or another since 65 and a trial lawyer since the 90s. And, and the text cross-examining experts in the behavioral sciences has been out for 20 years and is continually rolling along. What we teach in that book published by Thomson Reuters West is to use what judges say about experts and compare that to what the American Psychological Association, the National Association of Social Workers say in the ethical standards or codes of conduct, or in the case of psychologists, the, the uh, specialty guidelines in forensic psychology and use those for cross-examination. And so, you know, it's been published for 20 years. So, you know, when you look at the when you look at what judges say about Joanna Silberg, or you look at what judges say about Robert Geffner, there's a lot to write about. So I've been teaching lawyers how to use the material of science to determine the difference between good science and junk science. And so my orientation has to do with things like harking, causism hyperclaiming. Uh, so when I was in the involved in the process of writing for for uh, Professor uh, Nicholas Bala and Dr. Barbara Jo Fiddler, the uh, article that came out in the special issue for AFCC in April, 
uh, I was neck deep in, in uh, looking through ma material for the book that just came out uh, on parental alienation. I was doing that project at the same time with my co-editor, Professor William Burnett. So I was steeped very deeply in Joan Meyer's amicus briefs, Joan Meyer's law review articles, Joan Meyer's uh, VAW net, Joan Meyer's Journal of Child Custody articles, the newspaper articles citing her research. And so when I sent my original draft to Professor Bala and Barbara Jo Fiddler of my article for the special issue, they wrote back to me and they said, just a second, Demosthenes, Professor Meyer and her team have just published this report and we want you to talk about it. I thought, oh, well, okay. Uh, I know a lot about, I've read a lot about what Professor Meyer has to say. Um, okay, so I, I got, uh, I had just taken a look at, at an article called The Gender Trap published in the Washington Post. And, and uh, so, so I got child custody outcomes in cases involving parental alienation and abuse allegations and I read it. And um, I had to call Professor Harmon to get her to talk me down because my headache sort of, I, I got, I was concerned. I was very concerned about Why was that. Pardon me? Why was that? What was in the paper that gave you concern right away? Well, <laughs> uh, Professor Harmon calls it, uses the term woozling, which is, you know, which is a nice way of pointing out that, that things are going on in a, in a report that one, you know, one wonders about. I mean, these are very serious concerns that the Meyer team were describing. You know, if women who are abused come to court and say, I've been abused and some guy pulls uh, some sort of theory out of his hat or talks about parental alienation and brings in three textbooks, boom, she loses custody. That's terrible. So these were very important questions. And I, I said that for Professor Bala and Barbara Jo Fiddler. But what I noticed was when I read it, it seemed to me that there was lots and lots of causism going on. And, and, and causism is the tendency to imply a causal relationship between factor A and factor B when the research doesn't support that. Um, we see this in language like as a result of, or the consequence of, or the effect of, where the language should be, it's related to, or maybe inferred from. And, and we see hyperclaiming as well. And I thought I was looking at hyperclaiming, and that is the tendency to overstate uh, implications of specific research. Hyperclaiming is best debunked by an explication of the research design and the statistical methodology. And, and, and the, Professor Harmon was burning up the internet back and forth with me over her sense of the methodology uh, and the statistical processes utilized. And so if you're improperly testing hypotheses or you use small unrepresentative samples and then you generalize rather dramatically about that, you're hyperclaiming. And so I thought what I was reading was cargo cult science. I mean, I actually thought it was cargo cult science. And um, maybe participants don't know, but in 1974, the Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman described in a commencement address to California Institute of Technology what cargo cult science was. He said that in World War II, uh, the Pacific Islanders watched cargo planes come in and bring loads and loads of materiel. And when the war was over and the Allied forces left, well, the Islanders still wanted the cargo planes to land and bring all kinds of materiel. So they made, they made their own runways. They stationed guys with wooden walkie talkies and bamboo antennas and they lighted fires and they waited for the planes to land. So as, Fam as Feynman explained it, cargo cult scientists act in the same way. And Feynman said, quote, they follow all the apparent precepts and forms of scientific investigation, but they're missing something essential because the planes don't land. So Dr. Uh, Professor Harmon said, well, now Demosthenes, come on. We don't want people to think that we're being mean and, and, and let's keep it 
let, let, let's see if we can find a more euphemistic term. And what about woozling? And woozling, as we explained, is uh, woozles are a, a, a faulty or a partial or uh, misinterpreted research claims that are pulled together and, uh, and used to mislead people. Uh, woozles are not supported, or maybe they're only partially supported by empirical evidence, and uh, they're created through misrepresentation of the research they rely on or confirmatory bias. They're often uh, motivated by uh, ideology and they overshadow challenges. It's, it, it, it's difficult. The, the Woozel effect has been defined in science as uh, evidence by citation. And it occurs when citations to publications which lack evidence are brought together and used to mislead and non-facts and factoids develop. So I saw all of these problems just basically, and I'm in the midst of having to write to, to a, a Nicholas Bella and a Barbara Jo Fiddler, and I'm, and I'm struggling with this. So in September of 19, uh, 2019, uh, I, I was able to meet with Professor Harmon and we were able to discuss what to do about this. But let me just say that, uh, in fairness to, in fairness to the Meyer team, um, if the Meyer team was observe, looking looking at a bunch of material and observing it and saying, "This is what we observe," and we think that folks should should consider this, and and perhaps it should form part of a dialogue for for public policy discussions. That's one thing. I mean, I've certainly done that. 25 years ago, I published a, a law review article that argued about science and suggested that public policy needed to be changed, and it eventually was in this area. So that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you engage in harking, which is hypotheses after results are known, uh, and you put some statistics on the sort of like, like putting icing on a cake that's not done well, uh, it lends itself to hyperclaiming, causism, woozling, and all that sort of stuff. So I took my Meyer report and all my other Meyer material and met with Professor Harmon and basically was swimming in annotations and sticky notes and, and all that sort of thing. And we began to uh, look at uh, what were the basis of the opinions, what were the sources, et cetera. Uh, in some of Meyer's work, were, were they accurate? Were they valid? I can talk more about that in a minute. But the important thing to know is that Professor Harmon insisted that if we were going to replicate this, we had to set it up in a way that scrupulously controlled for our prior orientation or what we thought was the right thing to say. Because these were important questions and if the Meyer data was accurate, holy Toledo, we had problems. So that's what brought me to it. That tells you a little bit about me. Professor Harmon can explain how hard we worked to make sure that our own prejudices were completely insulated from uh, what the results turned out to be. Professor Harmon, uh, let me ask you this. Some people who may read your paper and who just heard Dr. Lorandos explain why you came to this topic, they may interpret this as an attack on the Meyer team. Is that what you intended when you began this uh, research? No, not at all. Um, you know, I'm a scientist. And as I mentioned before, the axiom of science is replication. And it's not an attack. It's not a criticism. Um, you know, a lot of times when people do studies, research studies, the, they could find a significant effect. And it might be due to the fact that maybe they captured something that is a real phenomenon. It could be due to chance, you know, maybe some odd, you know, person, you know, they just had an interesting group of people who answered in a particular way on that day. So we don't know if that effect can generalize to other people at other times. It could be, you know, just by chance and error in the statistics that that a, a finding was made. And so all science is designed to try to replicate and build on knowledge. And so 
you know, when, when there's an important paper that comes out that had really important research questions, I think it's very important if, if you're going to start changing policies and addressing laws and, and, and creating laws to on a basis of one paper, it's even more important to see whether or not that could be replicated um, and whether or not those effects really hold up in other populations using other samples and other things. And so, you know, and this is something if, if people think that this is new, it's, this is how science works. I mean, cognitive dissonance theory, which most of probably the audience knows about, that was subjected to 20, dec or 20 years, two decades of research um, with a, an opposing theory called self-presentation theory that was battling it out in the scientific literature. One, you know, Leon Festinger and his team would do a study, Daryl Bem and a whole bunch of other people do a study. And these weren't like always pleasant debates. In fact, there was yelling at conferences and other things because people really believe that their theory was the one that explained the effect. And, and that's due to replication. Like let's do this study, but let's measure it this way. Let's do this study and measure it this way. And it's not personal. It's, it's look, here's an, you had a good research question. I have a different theory about why that might be the case. Or I think maybe you did it wrong, so let me do it this way and see if we find the same effect. That's what we did. And I think that that's so important in any, as all of science, particularly when children's lives are at stake. And that's why I was really motivated to do this study, because I think it's important to make sure that we're getting closer to what's happening and understanding what's happening. Can I jump in on the issue of are we attacking them? Sure. Uh, uh, I think that it's important uh, to separate uh, ag, ad, ad argumentum from ad hominem. You know, we're, we're looking at, well, let me say it this way. Twice in a 40 year career of publishing, two times, only two times have I been asked to look at what a law professor has published in a law journal and asked and suggested that this should be the bedrock of public policy change. Uh, and I've been asked twice. Once I was asked in 2002 by Richard Gardner to look at a paper by a, a law professor who suggested that uh, there was a whole bunch wrong with Richard Gardner. Uh, this particular law professor started by misstating Gardner's hypothesis and then and then, and then misstated the research of um, Thonis and Tajin about the, the number of false sex abuse cases in high contest uh, divorce uh, matters. Um, what else did this person go on and say? Oh yes, this person relied on a variety of, of, of as we talked about with respect to Woosling, uh, relied on a variety of sources that were particularly troublesome. And remember, we want to know if we're gonna rely on something what are the basis of the opinion? What are the sources? Are they accurate? Are they valid? Are they reliable? Um, and, and this particular person uh, said that courts regularly assume that allegations of abuse are false and that parental alienation is a theory. It's used as an explanation focusing uh, on the accuser as the abuser and then pulling children away from this person. I thought, hmm, wow, that's not good. And so I, be, I looked more closely because Gardner had asked me to look at this law review article. And it turns out that, that some of the material that this person was relying on was really suspect. And that is to say, she, she described um, Gardner's uh, idea. She, she said, she explained uh, numerous cases in which trial courts have transferred children's custody. What did she say? Two. A known or likely abusers and custodial parents have been denied contact with the children they've been trying to protect. <laughs> That's terrible. So let's drill down. What did she rely on for that? Well, she based this assertion on a newspaper article by a person uh, who's a stringer who wrote in the Pasadena Star by the name of Karen Winner. And Karen Winner was a member of the California Protective Parents Association. Okay, but this is a, a Karen Winner uh, des described herself as an investigative reporter. And when you look carefully at what Karen Winner actually said, and remember, this is the person that the professor relied upon. 
if you look carefully at, at who Karen Winner is, you found out that she wrote a book called Divorce from Justice, The Abuse of Women and Children by Divorce Lawyers and Judges. And her website, The Justice Seeker, said, need an expert to debunk parental alienation? Parental alienation syndrome, need an expert to evaluate whether your divorce lawyer is engaged in business practices to put his or her financial interests above the client's welfare? This small but growing list of free public service, blah, 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 blah. So an okay. is not a scientist. Not only not a scientist, but a person who has an ax to grind. And, and so uh, I published a response in the 2006 International Handbook of Parental Alienation, but I noticed some of the same things. The second time I was asked, and I was kind of trapped by Professor Bala and Barbara Jo Fiddler, I was asked to comment on a law professor's a, a, a law journal article that the law professor suggested should uh, drive public policy was the Meyer article. And so I, I, looking carefully at this, I noticed that she explained that um, she called the people that, that won custody, if they were men, batterers with custody. She said, uh, but when we when when we consider the support that Meyer used in in one of her articles for her assertion that men who successfully win custody after their ex-wives make allegations of abuse are batterers with custody, if we look at the source, we see there's two sources. One is a book, and if you Google the website of the book publisher, you come up with American Candle Supply. And another is a now defunct internet link. Well, okay, fine. Maybe the publisher's out of business. But if you look at the book that that uh, Professor Meyer used to, to as support for her idea that men are are uh, abusers with are uh, abusers with custody and batterers, the co-author of the book was was a uh, an attorney named Newstein. And this book. I think it was called something about, let me see what my, my notes say. Um, it was, um, let's see, ma something about mad. Oh yes, um, from madness to mutiny, why mothers are running from the family courts and what can be done about it, et cetera. Well, if you look at the authors, Ms. Newstein was an attorney and uh, upon the, in her fa in Miss Newstein's family law case, uh, the family court judge that dealt with it criticized this author for specious abuse allegations against her child's father and ultimately removed the child from her care. Uh, the, the removal was based upon the recommendations of the law guardian, the child welfare agency, uh, and due to fears that Newstein would cause the child emotional harm. A second judge became involved and ultimately awarded the child's uh, father sole custody and ordered that Newstein have visitation. Then Newstein attempted to, to sue the Child Welfare Agency and the city of New York over her due process rights and the Eastern District of New York, where you, Mr. Joshi, and I are both members, dismissed those actions. Well, if you look at the co-author of this book that Professor Meyer relies upon for her idea that they're just abusers with custody, you see that it's Michael Lesher. Well, during the time that this was developed, Michael Lesher couldn't practice law because Michael Lesher had been suspended from the practice of law. And so, you know, that, and then there's, there, there's, there's humorous uh, examples in, in Meyer's work that, that, that bothered me. And there's many examples of poor scholarship and, and, and that robs people of the ability to recognize when you exercise poor scholarship, and I'll finish it quickly when you exercise poor scholarship, and I had this kicked into me at the New School for Social Research, you know, get it together or there goes your scholarship, Bunky. When you exercise poor scholarship, it robs people like Meyer of their, of their ability to recognize their erroneous assumptions and conclusions uh, in, and instead leads to what Kruger and Dunning said was a inflated self-assessment. And it, it, sometimes it goes from the sublime to the ridiculous. At one point uh, in Meyer's work, she offers many mischaracterizations 
of, of Gardner's work without identifying any authority for, for those statements. And at one point, she claimed that the well-known phrase, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, was biblical. Well, <laughs> no, it isn't. If you look at it, and it's not hard to figure this out, you know, it's not hard to figure out that Newstein, who's Newstein, and what the judges say about Newstein, and what the judges who took the license away from Lesher say about Lesher. But when you look at hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, you discover that even though there's a lot of scorning in the Bible, that's not where this comes from. The, the phrase comes from William Congreve in 1697 in the play Morning Bride, in which the phrase is, heaven hath no rage like love to hatred turn, nor hell hath a fury, nor, nor hell a fury like a woman scorned, Morning Bride, Act 3, Scene 1. Okay, the point is, when you're going to rely on somebody and law and evidence in law and public policy should be based on real reliability testing. I've been teaching that for 20 years. You need to know what's the basis of the opinion? What are the sources? Are they accurate? Are they valid? Are they reliable? And yes, this is the kind of animated speech that Professor Harmon had to talk me down from when we were personally meeting and having discussions about this so, so that we could set up a methodology for actually looking at the conclusions. To hell with the methodological problems, we had to cope with those, but the questions that they said that they proved really were important to look at to make sure, I mean, are judges and guardians ad litems doing a terrible job? When social services get involved, are they screwing everything up? Yikes, we needed to look at that. So I, so I wanted to tell you that the two times that I've been asked to comment for what it, for whatever my opinion is worth on a law review article being used for public policy purposes. One was recently in AFCC and the other one was 20 years ago. So that's, so when I met Professor Harmon face to face to discuss all this stuff, thanks be to God, the gods in the, in the heavens that she was able to calm me down and talk me down from this and get us back to methodology, get us back to methodology, get us back to methodology. Yeah, can I comment on that? Um, you know, I know that's a, a big backstory of how we got here, but I think it's very important backstory um, because now when we get to how we designed this study and what we did, and we could answer questions that I know Ashish, you've prepared um, for, because from your perspective, there was a lot of things that, you know, you're, you're confused confusing for you um, and we're happy to answer them now but I think that's important to know that backstory because it helps us understand why we we made the the methodological decisions that we did um, and and why we tested things the way that we did sure that, that's very helpful no doubt about it thank you you mentioned that much of the scientific debate happens in peer-reviewed journals where scientists are debating concepts and data and research back and forth I'm, not, I'm an attorney, I'm not a scientist. And like me, there are many, many, many family law practitioners and judges and referees who have to read papers, research, and then figure out whether they can trust it or not. So can you tell us a little bit about the peer review process and what it really means? And so peer review doesn't mean you just had a few friends or colleagues read a book you wrote and write an approval, you know, like a little comment or pre preface. A peer review mean in an academic or scientific journal means that you've submitted a paper that you've published and it's evaluated by your peers based on the scholarly merits, the basis of the ideas and the, the, the methods that are used. Um, and usually what happens is that an editor looks it over and decides whether or not they think it will even pass peer review and whether the paper has some significant contribution to the scientific literature and that it would be a fit for the journal. Then they assign it to three or four um, reviewers who are blind to the work, meaning they don't know who did the study. They you know, usually will take off all information so that the reviewers don't know who did it and hopefully minimize the biases that might come with that. Um, and then they offer their critique of the work um, and usually suggestions on what needs to be changed if, it, if they feel that there's a chance that the work could be published. 
Um, and this usually goes through several reviews, like several times. And the editor has to decide whether or not they think it's worth having any more revisions or not. Uh, and then finally, ultimately, if the editor decides that the, and the, the reviewers have decided that the, re, the authors have met the burden of proof, essentially, and, and can, you know, address the concerns that were raised, then they will accept the paper. So it's a long process, um, and it's, but it's, and it's rigorous, and it's at a very important part of the scientific process to ensure that um, journals publish good work. Now, there's a lot of variability across journals in how well they do this. Um, and as part of the open science movement, there's been um, it, uh, attention made to, to journals that are more open about that process than others. Now, that's an important thing you just mentioned. And that was my next question to you. In your paper, you mentioned something about open science framework. What is that? Um, open Science Framework is one of several software programs out there where researchers and scientists can post their information in a public venue so that it's open and transparent. Uh, and this, th this kind of developed at, out of a crisis that happened in science, not just social sciences, but in medicine as well, where people were finding studies were not replicating. When people would do a study, someone else would try to do it and they would look at the paper and read what the people did and it wouldn't have a lot of information. You know, like they would maybe not report all the methods that they used, or they wouldn't report all the, the decisions that were made about how they analyzed their data. And so if somebody picked up that paper, they wouldn't be able to replicate it. And that's a real problem for science. And that reached a real crucial point about 15 or 10 years ago, when scientists were saying, we can't replicate some of the big findings in social psychology or in neuropsychology or in medicine. And what does that mean for what we know? <laughs> what do we really know if we can't replicate anything? And so that led to a big change in how science is done. And this is where open science practices were developed as a way to do that. So what that means is that when I come up with a hypothesis for a study, I have to be very clear that I did it before I collect my data and before I analyze it, before I play around with the data. And I have an analytic plan designed before I do all of that. And I have clearly written it all out. And then what you do is you archive it. You post it up into an open science framework where we call it pre-registration, where you lock it away and it's date stamped. And this is a way to ensure that people are doing what they say they're gonna do. Because what they were finding is sometimes researchers were going back after analyzing their data and they'd get an interesting finding and go, oh, I think I know why that happened. And then they'll create a hypothesis for it. And that's what we call harking. That's what we call harking. This is hypothesis after results are known. And it's a very questionable research practice because it means you could just fish around in your data until you find something and then come up with some rationale about why you found it. And that is not, that's not what we call confirmatory hypothesis testing. And so we wanted to make sure when we did our study, when we looked at the Meyer report um, or the Meyer team's paper, there weren't very clear hypotheses that were spelled out. There were a lot of results that were presented as if they were predicted a priori or beforehand. But when you go back to the intro, the introduction of the paper, we couldn't tell where that hypothesis was actually described very clearly and what the analytic plan was. So that's what, that's so part of open science is to say, if I look at a paper, can I reconstruct what that person did and do it myself? And, and so open science helps ensure doing that by making all your materials public, everybody can see what you've done and it makes it where it's easier for people to replicate your work. And so, we made sure to do that. It allows, it, it guarantees transparency and accountability at the same time. Right, exactly. Yes, and, that, and that's really important. I, I think especially in a research topic that's so heated and um, con controversial, right? Um, and where there's potentially bias. I think it's so important to, I think to almost expect open science practices um, uh, for people doing work in this area and other areas too that are contentious.
you mentioned that replication is important but the Meyer team did not detail some of their methods in their paper, right? So how were you able to replicate that? That's a good question. Um, so the way you usually do this as a scientist is you look to the methods and you see what they did. Um, and you try to then, you know, see whether or not, and you look to the sampling to see how they got their sample. Um, and we read through the paper and we couldn't quite figure out, there wasn't a lot of detail provided. Um, it's mentioned that a search string was used with 40 terms or 40 lines, but it wasn't provided. Um, it refers the reader to appendix B and C um, for information, um, and it wasn't in the report. Uh, so that led uh, Demosthenes and I to uh, have somebody from our research team contact Joan Meyer to ask her for that information, because we couldn't replicate it without that. Right, so I made a list of what we needed to replicate. I, I made a list of what we did know they did, but there were a lot of questions that I had to, to make it possible, such as we needed the search string uh, of what, how they got their cases. We wanted to see appendix B and C, which they talk about, which is the code book that they used and, we, and, the, and the data or the output of their statistics. So we could see the models that were run. Uh, and we asked for the cases that were included in the sample so that we would know what those cases were. Uh, and we were denied that information. Um, and so we were kind of left to our own devices to kind of, you know, how would you say reverse engineer? <laughs> we were trying to reverse engineer the study based on what was available. And so in a way we couldn't do a direct replication, no, how, no matter how, mar, how much we wanted to, because we, didn't, we weren't provided information even when we asked for it. So we were left to try to design what we call more of a conceptual replication, which is let's take the findings that are reported there related to parental alienation. Now, to be clear, we didn't look at the findings related to just abuse. That was a, that's a totally different set of research questions. We're more concerned about the parental alienation findings. And we constructed testable hypotheses very clearly based on the findings that, that the Meyer team reported in their results section. And then we designed the study to get at that. And so that's, that's all we could do. So it wasn't a direct replication like we wanted to and we attempted to, but it's, it's a conceptual replication. Doc, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I, I think it's important. We, you know, we asked for the 10 line net Lexus search. We asked for the coding manual. We asked for the list of 4,338 cases. We asked for Appendix B. We asked for Appendix C. And we got blown off. So we operationalized the conclusions and tested and made those conclusions a hypothesis. And, and and constructed a detailed table explaining what those hypotheses seemed to be, how they, how things were done that made it difficult to really sustain uh, a, a judgment about whether that hypothesis was accurate or not, and how we were going to test it. Dr. Harmon, on page four of your paper, you have a table, table one. And this is where you discuss the methodological flaws of the Meyer team in the study. And this is where we all, you also talk about what Dr. Lorando spoke about, harking and other things. Can you briefly explain what this table represents, why it's important? Um, well, the table is our kind of attempt to reverse engineer what was done and try to figure out what did they do, what, um, and how would we design our study to either try to replicate it or um, try to provide a more rigorous test? Um, so on each, each example on the issue in the table is what we identified and in the middle are just what, what threats to validity does that have for a study? What threats to generalizability does that have for that study? And so then, then we talked about how we were designing our study to try to remedy that. 
Now, one of the important things that I think is, is important to mention is that we were looking only at cases where parental alienation was alleged or found. Um, and in, it wasn't entirely clear from the report that the Meyer team uh, report uh, published um, what a lot of their statistical comparison groups were. Like, so they, they said that they had a database of paradigm cases where alienation was found, but paradigm cases was not defined. So I don't know what that was. Then they had a case, a set of a database of all abuse cases, which I think meant they were only allegations of abuse, but it's not clear. And then it appeared that even though there were no statistical models that were provided, I didn't know how they did their statistics, but that's how I, if I could have seen those, I would have, if I could have seen Appendix C, <laughs> I could have seen how they were testing their models and whether that actually is a test of a hypothesis. So I'm a, I, I serve on a lot of dissertation committees. And if I had gotten a report that didn't clearly specify how the analysis plan was gonna happen to test the hypothesis, I would have sent it back to my graduate student and asked them to expand on it more, explain more what you're testing here. Um, and from what I can deconstruct from what is in the report, the, the statistical models compared cases where there was allegation or a finding of parental alienation and cases where there was finding of abuse and no parental alienation. I think that's what was happening, but it's not clear based on what was reported. But, and if that was the case, that actually does not provide a critical test of the hypothesis. And this is, it's, I, I don't wanna get into statistics here and I could kind of go into this offline for people who wanna know that, but what, what, by doing it that way, there's an underlying assumption that all allegations of, a, of parental alienation are false because they're just a legal argument made to defend against abuse claims. And it assumes that all allegations of abuse need to be believed. Okay. And that's, Sounds pretty that flies in the face of scientific research that allegations of abuse are common in high conflict cases, high custody cases, cases which is, or high, um, lots of conflict over custody cases. And that's what these cases are, right? And we know that a lot of people lie about parental alienation as well as lie about abuse. And we know that there's a lot of people who are victims of both. And there's strong literature, scientific literature in both domains. So if that was the comparison that was being made in the statistical models, there's not a true test about whether or not allegations of, of abuse and allegations of parental alienation are being like, like differentiated between those who are legitimately abused or just claiming to be abused and undermining protections for those who are really abused. And the people who claim they're being alienated, they're undermining protections from the people who are being alienated, right? Um, and so, so that was concerning to me. And so that's why we only looked at those cases where alienation was alleged or found. We only looked at those because then we can compare whether or not if somebody goes to court and they say, hey, I'm being alienated, they're not automatically getting their kids. That's not what we found. And in fact, in our, in our sampling, in our, in our data, we found that 70% of the cases where moms were being alienated, there was no allegation of abuse. And so in 50% of the cases where dads were being alienated, there was no allegation of abuse. So parental alienation isn't only being used to defend against abuse claims. <laughs> Over half of the cases, there is no abuse claim. Right? And, and what we're talking about here is the use of children to hurt another parent. And, and that's abusive. There's a long literature in, in the independent violence literature of parents using children to threaten and control and manipulate the other person. And that's what parental alienating behaviors are. We just call it something different, but it's the same thing. And I think what we found in our study when we compare people who are just saying that they're alienated versus those where the court or some expert found it, they're able to tell the difference for the most part. Not all of them, but they're able to tell the difference. So 
we were so torqued about the possibility that all the things that the Meyer team said was accurate. I'll give you the lawyer version. Wow, there's real reason to be skeptical about, you know, looking at back at what Meyer's stuff over the years, there's reason to be skeptical. Nevertheless, if what her team is finding is true, is accurate, wow, we need to deal with it. So understanding our prejudices, how do we construct a methodologically rigorous analysis of this and, and do it in a double blind and a, and, a, and a scientifically defensible way so that our prejudices have no impact on it and then crunch the ever living daylights out of the numbers so that we can come up with finding because our judge is doing a terrible job. Our guardian's doing a terrible job. If you are being abused, you just automatically lose your kids. That'd be terrible. So we really worked hard to figure out how can we develop methodologically sound uh, uh, procedures and then guard against anybody uh, anybody's ideas woozling into the into the mix and keep it as clean as possible. Right. Nope. Yeah, and I want to be mindful of time. I know we have half an hour left. Um, yeah, I Ashish, have a couple have... of questions and then we'll go into the question and answer session. Yes. Can, can you hear me okay, by the way? Yes. All right. One of the hallmark of a good research paper, good scientific paper, is that the paper tells you about the limitations of the research. And in your paper, you and Dr. Lorandos talk about the limitations of your research. Was there any similar thing done by the Meyer team? Um, well, they talk about some of the limitations, like about that their, that their cases were appellate cases, which is what we what we use too, right? And there's limits to that. Um, you know, for example, like if do we know that um, you know when a court decided alienation was going on, and there's no mention of other people involved with the case, do we know that other people were not involved in the case or not? We don't know, because at the appeal level, there's not a lot of detail compared to what you might see at the trial level. Some cases, there was a lot of detail, <laughs> but some were very limited. So we don't know, we don't know a lot. And, but that's, that's the same limit for both studies. That's the same limitation. Um, and that's why we're replicating it right now, looking at trial level studies. That's why replication is important because if that's a problem at the appeal level, let's do a different level of the court system to see whether or not that, that is a methodological issue. Um, but the problem is, I think, you know, when, when we were talking about hyperclaiming and other things, when you go beyond your limitations and try to call for drastic action like changing federal law about child abuse, that's not acknowledging the limitations of your study. That's far overreaching the limitations of a study. Um, and so that's where it's a problem, you know? And so that I wouldn't say if you, if you looked at our study that this says that we need to go change policy based on our study, I'd be the last person to say that. <laughs> I would say, stop taking action using the other study until we know more. I would say, let's devote some grant money to this and solicit proposals from top researchers across the country to independently look at this because it's important because all these children's lives are at stake. Let's do that. Solicit the best proposals and test this out before we move forward anymore. So That's what I would say. So application is needed before you can be confident that this right. can be now used to affect policy change or legislation. Right, yeah. I mean, is, is, there, is there a gold standard as to how much more replication is needed? How many more studies need to be done? It's not really a standard, but you know, I, I've published several meta-analyses in my time. <laughs> and you usually, I mean, before you go and change, you know, how we do intervention work, for example, you'd want to have, you know, 20, 30 studies that are showing strong or medium effects, right? And start showing similar patterns over time. You'd want, but it depends on, on how strong the effects are in each of those studies, how large are the samples. You know, there's, there's a lot of what kinds of methods were used. Ideally, you'd want to find similar effects using different samples in different contexts, different people, um, you know, and so different measures that are used, different methods. So it's not just archival research like what we did, you know, you want to look at some other research, you know, other methods.
not in, it's hard, you, it's really hard. You can't do experiments in this research. It's not ethical, right? So we have to do other methods to, to get at this. So there's not really a gold standard, but you'd want to have more than one or two. <laughs> I can say that. That's one, of the, that's one of the wonderful things about a group like AFCC. When I was asked to comment to, on Milchman and Meyer and et cetera, one of the things that I said was, these are important questions. Let's get together. You know, you know, just, don't just take our word for it. I mean, it, we did good science. I mean, if I'm going to talk about science, I damn well ought to be able to do good science. So the reviewers said it's good science, but that's just one paper. Let's get together. Let's collaborate. Let's make sure that these things that the Meyer team said was happening, and by the way, we could not support any of their conclusions, but you know, maybe we can get together and get some common language and some common research uh, goals and orientations and do it together. Right. Okay, so we have about uh, 27 minutes left. Let's go into the questions that we have got from the audience, okay? Okay. Uh, how could you have the same data set as Meyer and find such different conclusions? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, we don't have the same data set. Um, I don't even know what is in their data set still. So um, the sampling strategy um, that I think that was used was very different. Um, I still, I'm still not entirely certain all the exclusion criteria that were used by the team for the Meyer study. Um, for example, I do know based on the report that they excluded cases where both parents claimed that they were being abused by the other. Now in our sample, that's 20% of our cases. So that means, I don't know, you know, so what, what that does is it poses problems with who you, who the, who the results can generalize to, right? You know, so if I find an effect, but I only found it with certain people, then my effect may not apply to anybody else, right? So our data set is very different, I think, because we didn't use the same exclusion criteria. We didn't really use any exclusion criteria. We just said if it, if it alienation, a uh, claim was made and we, we just limited our sample to equal numbers of men and women sequentially going from the 2018 back or backwards. Um, that was our exclusion criteria. We just wanted to make, you know, and we just included well, cases. Hold on where a second, hold on a second, because one of the things that you insisted on Professor Harmon was you insisted that our data set would be readily available to anybody who wanted to look at it. Every case, every coding book, all of the all the coding protocols, absolutely everything. So while we don't know what their data set actually was, you definitely do know what our data set was. Right. Yeah, but what, what I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Harmon and Dr. Lorandos, as a layman, is that if you don't have their data set, how can you compare as to what they did compared to what you did? How can you decide which one of you are correct in your findings and analysis? I mean, if I'm a judge and I have the Harmon Lorandos paper and I have the Meyer team paper, how do I know which one is good science? Sources, methods, openness, of uh, availability of data, appropriate testing protocols, clear statements of hypotheses, clear statements of procedures, double blind, everything that Professor Harmon absolutely insisted upon, freely available, publicly available, and rigorous peer review. I mean, the peer reviewers sent it back to us several times and said, well, can you rephrase this? And what about that? And I don't understand this. The process of peer review. That's entirely the opposite of what happened in the Meyer team work. Okay. All right, uh, another question. You say something about not all journals have the same peer review process or quality control. How can someone who is not a scientist know if a paper or a journal is a good paper? How can we rely on things because they all appear to be scientific to non-scientists? Right, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> Well, in, in science, one, one way that one metric that's used is an impact factor of the journal, 
Now there's a lot of debate and misuse of this impact factor, but the impact factor usually reflects the quality of the journal, meaning that the papers that are published there are cited more often, right? And they're cited in diverse settings. It's not just somebody citing themselves. These are people citing them, right? So um, usually then if it's a very, um, a very kind of transparent and clear peer review process, the quality of the papers that are published there um, are higher, they're cited more. Um, so there's a couple ways to tell um, based on just the journal. Um, and you can look up impact factors just by searching the journal and you can type in impact, impact factor and search that up on Google and you'll find it. Um, now, you can also, like, like Demo said, you look up, you know, look at the methods, look at, you know, sometimes people will publish a, a paper, a really good paper in a lower impact journal because they want to reach a particular audience, right? And maybe it's not as high on the scientific ladder, but they want to make sure an audience gets it. You can still evaluate a paper on that. Um, but again, you want to look at what is the theoretical kind of foundation or the, um, the, the scientific foundation of the hypotheses that are being tested or, or the, the ideas that are being presented? What are the sources being used? Are those legitimate sources? Um, is the method a good one for that research question? Um, and you know, there's many methods of inquiry and they all have their pros and cons. Um, there's lots of things experiments can't tell us, for example, even though that's the gold standard in medicine and other things, there's a lot of things they can't tell us. Uh, and so those are the kinds of things you'd want to look at if a paper is good. Now, the review process, you'd want to make sure it has a really good peer review process. And the editorial board aren't people who are all citing each other, right? <laughs> you want to have a good editorial board that is scientific and demonstrated kind of unbiased opinions, you know, and pieces. Uh, and so um, that's something I look for uh, in, an, in a journal. But Demos, maybe you're the more the practitioner side. Maybe you could answer this better. Well, certainly you look at the editorial board. You look at the track record of the journal, the impact factor. But you also want to know um, when they got a new editor, did half the editorial board re uh, resign in protest and said, uh, why are you kidding me? You know, you want to look at what's the cycle politics behind this. And as an attorney, you're not going to know that stuff you're gonna to have to rely upon your expert. And if you don't trust your expert, get another one. There are plenty of uh, assistant professors looking for some extra cash and plenty of associate professors will give you a few minutes, just call them up and ask them. Do you think that there is no information on uh, Meyer's data set because she had to protect the names of the victims and the children? Is that one reason why Professor Meyer could not perhaps share the sources? I don't think so, because they're all, the appellate cases are all publicly available data. So, and you know, you can de-identify the cases and still share the data. You know, that, that's something that I often do. You can, you can just list in your data set the case number or some other thing without listing the names of people. So there's ways you can share data. If it's publicly accessible data, then there's no reason to hide that information, especially when you're not reporting and calling out a specific case. You're reporting cases in aggregate. And the coding of the cases, because you're coding them for did abuse happen? How many abuse claims were made? Was it made by a man? Was it made by a woman? Was parental alienation alleged? Did it, was it found? Was it not found? Was it, were the abuse allegations substantiated? So uh, when one of the things that troubled us was that all of this stuff is publicly available, which is why, of course, every one of our cases is freely available for you. You just got to go to the Open Science Framework. There it is. And, but the, but the Meyer report blocked us from getting the cases and put all kinds of impediments in the way, even though this was a publicly re funded research project, but all kinds of impediments in the way for us to find out. And we thought, well, wait a minute, these are publicly available published appellate cases. So that's another conundrum of work like this. How did you make sure your quarters did not know the study's hypothesis? That's a great question. So uh, I recruited uh, students who um, are psychology students, advanced psychology students who've taken research methods and are familiar with coding uh, techniques. We train them 
on the coding forms, which appear in the appendices of the paper. So you can see what those coding forms were. Um, and if you look at Open Science Framework, you can see all of their coding. Uh, and all of, you know, the, we had multiple coders, two coders coded each study. And we had them after the training, we had them com complete, write out what they thought the hypotheses were for the study in as great detail as possible. So I made them sit there for 20 minutes and write down <laughs> what they thought it was. And then they turned it in, their names aren't on it. All of the coders have letters that are associated with them. So that way they're not identifiable, but I have their information. Uh, and then at the end of the study, when they finished, after coding all of them, we asked them to again, write out what they thought the hypotheses were. And in this way, we could check to see whether or not, you know, granted we tested six hypotheses, most of it wrote out one, and it wasn't exactly what we were studying. And even if a, even if one student had kind of a guess that was related to something, it, there were two coders on each case, right? So any potential biases that one person may have had in what they were seeing, another person was who didn't know <laughs> was, was involved, right? So, so that's how we ensured that. And then the third person, who reconciled them was really only looking at those, those fields that were different between the two. And then look to the original data source to see what was actually in there and, and did that. So that's how we kept it blind. Um, and I think that that's very important. And, and then on the other side, on the case selection side, Demos's team, they were blind to hypothesis before because we hadn't even developed the hypotheses yet. Uh, they didn't know what they were. Blue. They, they simply had a job to do get the most recent, you know, you've got 3,000 something cases, get the most recent 250 where women were accused, get the most recent 250 where men were accused and it was substantiated in some way, get the most recent 250 where where women were, uh, were accused but it wasn't substantiated and the most recent 250 where men were accused and it wasn't substantiated, period, end of story, don't ask any questions, we need it by Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another question for you. Pre-registration and open science are new to me. Does your study imply that unless a study is pre-registered or doesn't provide information about it, we should not trust it? Ooh, that's a good question. If you had asked me like seven years ago, I wouldn't have said, yeah, you, no, I don't think so. But today, even just seeing what's happened in science, even in my field in social psychology, all the academic fraud that's happened, how people, um, we call it p-hacking, where they play with their data, but you don't know what they did. And that happens even in studies where there's less at stake other than ego, <laughs> where here you have families and you have all these other people and you have ideological beliefs and all of that is at stake. Today, I would say, unless it's pre-registered, all you have is trust that the people did it right. And that they didn't hark, they weren't harking after their data was done because pre-registered requires embargoing your methodology and your research questions and you can't fudge them later. So it, it, for, for lawyers and judges, it's an issue of weight. Right. Yeah, um, it's, it's, not saying, it's not saying don't trust it, but it's saying I would, I would have less confidence in it as a scientist, that unless I could verify, you know, if it's pre-registered and an open science framework and you look at our project page, you can see all our coding, you can see the analyses, you can see the output, you can see everything there, you can verify what we talk about. Um, and so I would have, you know, and then that way, and you know, no study's perfect. Our study in no way is perfect. I mean, you know, just because you're, you're, you're hamstrung by the methods you have, Right? You can only conclude so much. So, but it doesn't mean it's not valuable. It means it's important, but you want to have faith and confidence that what you're reporting is as close to what was observable. Do you think there's a movement definitely towards pre-registration as more and more papers do that? I don't see it yet. I did a search on open science framework on the topic of parental alienation and there haven't been any studies yet um, or domestic violence and in this area. I've, 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 went, I've read almost every journal article I've read over the last 10 years in 
this area of intimate partner violence and parental alienation, there's not hardly any, but I hope that changes. Within social science, like social psychology, neuropsych, it is becoming the norm. And I think applied sciences are a little slower uh, to catch up in that, but I think it's, it's happening. It's definitely happening. And, and there is a preference now in a lot of journals for, for articles that are pre-registered um, because there's, there's more certainty that what is being reported is probably closer to what actually the, the, the researchers did. And it's, it's, it's more verifiable and can be checked um, and that's, that's the important thing is being able to check what people have done. Here's another question. I do not understand how you did not find as many cases of abuse as it seems that the Maya team found. Why is that? Good question. Um, so we only looked at, uh, again, we were testing the hypotheses about parental alienation. We didn't select only cases where abuse was alleged first of all. And so, as I mentioned in, you know, 50% of the cases where a dad was accused of, or was alleging to be alienated, half of those, there wasn't even an allegation of abuse. Um, and for mothers, it was 70%. There wasn't an allegation of abuse. So I think, and it's hard to tell because again, there wasn't a lot of information that I could gather from the report. It's hard to tell what made the inclusion criteria for their database and what was excluded. Um, after we did our study, the Appendix B was finally made available on the National Archives or the National Institute of Justice Archives. And when I looked at that, it appeared in there that any claim of abuse, if, if somebody said it wasn't true or false, that the person who made the claim was discredited. Um, even if CPS, after multiple false allegations of abuse, came to the determination that that parent was misusing the system to try to get a custody advantage or to get at the other parent, even when that happened, that was coded as discrediting the parent's abuse claims, which I think kind of is a slap in the face of CPS and other people who are doing a lot of work trying to investigate allegations of abuse. And when they find that after 20 allegations, none of them are true and are actually are linked to, you know, something that that parent is doing to hurt the child and the other parent. That doesn't mean they're discrediting the abuse claims, but that is what is reported in Appendix B. Now we didn't know about that till after our study was done. So I think to get to that question about she found a lot more abuse claims, I think it goes to how they were coding abuse. And again, this goes to my earlier point, it appears as if they're saying any allegation needs to be taken as truth. And I think there's something Ill, very illogical, but it goes to a very gendered paradigm about violence that mothers only use aggression in defense against very abusive men. But that is not, a, there's a lot of people in the IPV you know, research area who say that that's, that's only some cases of abuse. That's not how all intimate partner violence happens. And in fact, men and women are, you know, if you look at the last 12 months, they're equally likely or 5.5% of them experience physical, sexual and stalking abuse. That's similar proportions, right? Um, and it, if so, it flies in the face of, you know, other research out there. And so I think there's a fundamental difference in how they coded abuse. In our data set, we didn't have we looked at how GALs and custody evaluators concluded parental alienation. We didn't look at whether they were the determiners of whether an allegation of abuse was true. Because what these evaluators were doing is summarizing lots of abuse claims that were investigated by other administrative systems like the police or CPS. They were the ones who made the determinations or sometimes therapists. And so it wasn't the GAL or the custody evaluator that necessarily discredited the allegation. This is something that the court factored in. And I, we've gotten some questions over the last few weeks about how did courts sometimes come up with a determination that alienation happened when maybe a GAL did it or a custody evaluator did it. 
Now, again, this is a limitation of appellate research is, you know, or looking at these appellate cases because the de amount of detail varied a lot. Um, in some cases, you know, courts don't have to agree with an evaluator, right? And they don't have to agree with their conclusions. Um, it does beg the question as, is who's right? We don't know. And we can't tell that from the data that Meyer probably had at her disposal or ours. We don't know for sure. But, you know, if you have enough cases on average, you're going you're gonna to start to weed out those where there's definitive kind of evidence that was looked at by the court that says, wow, this parent is engaging in a lot of behaviors to undermine the relationship. They don't even have to call it parental alienation to say they're hurting this relationship, right? Um, and so anyway, I'm sure Dimas can add to this. I mean, the judges have to assign weight to any evidence. You know, you could have a custody evaluation report that says, for example, there is no parental alienation going, but the family court judge may reach a different conclusion based upon the evidence that's right. in front of the judge of the behaviors. Absolutely. And they have probably more of a history of the case. I know a lot of custody evaluators sometimes only look at the more recent history. They don't even look at the past. Uh, courts have more at their disposal to look at in that regard. Um, and sometimes, you know, the evaluator gets it right, but the court doesn't, right? So there, there, there could be, there could just because of opinions about what the problem is, uh, maybe misunderstanding and miseducation about it. Um, you know, there's been a lot of research that's been published over the last few years that really is, you know, kind of building a really strong scientific base about uh, parental alienation that a lot of people aren't aware of. Uh, so I think that, um, you know, it's, that, that explains why sometimes courts and custody evaluators didn't agree, right? Um, and the evaluators themselves, you know, I mean, they were only a, a percentage of our cases, you know, not all cases even had the money to get an evaluator, you know, uh, you know or they didn't have one uh, for other reasons, but yeah. I think we have time to take probably two more questions. So here's another one. What evidence do you have that parental alienation is not being used as an excuse to get out of a claim of abuse? Good question. Well, as I mentioned before, we found half of the cases where, or between 50 and 70% of the cases where somebody was claiming alienation and there wasn't an allegation of abuse. And our evidence shows um, across two of the hypotheses we tested that when somebody goes into court and says, I'm being alienated, unless a finding had been made by an evaluator or the court also agreed because of evidence, they weren't getting custody of the kids. It wasn't something that they were just going in and just, it wasn't like a silver bullet <laughs> to go and get kids, right? Um, and it appeared to us clearly when we looked at all the allegations of abuse that were being made, and we counted all of them. We, 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 we coded every single allegation. So if somebody called the police 20 times, we coded that 20 times, okay? So we captured every allegation. Uh, we didn't roll them all together into, was there a finding of abuse or not? We looked at the nuances of these, who investigated, how deeply. So, and it was clear to us that these were not just being blown over. Like they were not just like thrown out of, out of hand. People were looking at it closely. And, um, and so, I, you know, I don't think there's any evidence that that's, it's being used that way in our, in our data that we found. And Adimas, you wanna talk about that? Yeah. yeah, two things to say about that. First of all, thank you for the question. Every one of the conclusions that from the Meyer report that we tested was falsified. Every one of them. Key for me, as a child advocate for decades is the judges, the guardians ad litem, the lawyers are doing a heck of a good job trying to get to the bottom of this. The suggestion that, that when someone says they're being abused and somebody else says, oh no, well it's parental alienation, they just say, well, okay, forget the abuse claim is ridiculous. It's insulting and judges and, and lawyers need to know hey, you know what? We tested this and you're doing a darn good job. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. I, that was indeed uh, going to be my final questions. Um, when we read the Meyer report or the research of the Meyer team, as a family practitioner, you sit back and think about 
is this true? If all you need to change custody is to walk into a court of law and yell parental alienation, and the judges just change custody based upon that, that's horrible. But that doesn't seem to be true, apart from the, my own anecdotal experience as a practitioner litigating alienation cases and domestic violence cases in the courts around the country. If anything, it is overwhelmingly difficult to make a case of parental alienation and prove it in a court of law. But reading your paper, can we get a sense that the family court judges are indeed trying very hard to get to the bottom of the allegations and take the allegations of domestic violence indeed very seriously? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it, if you look at the cases where there's in the reports where there were multiple claims of abuse, like intimate partner violence and child abuse, and there were concerns about alienation as well. Um, it was clear they weren't just saying, well, they're just making up abuse in order to get out of an, an abuse claim, or they're just making up parental alienation to get out of this. Um, and in fact, we pulled, we write about this in the paper. We, we, we then, after we did all our analyses as just an exploratory um, uh, kind of analysis, we looked at those cases where there had been a finding of abuse of a parent and the other parent was found to be alienating the child. So, and there were, I believe only about 16 out of 967 <laughs> where that happened. And Demos had his team go and look at that and say, what happened? How, how, did, how did this person who had a finding of abuse against them get custody of the kids when the other parent was alienating? And maybe Demos, you could speak to that. We rigorously went after every one of those because I don't wanna hear that somebody who's an abuser is just getting custody. That's ridiculous. Um, what we found was that the abuse claims happened way in the past, people had been through, uh, treatment with respect to this stuff and the behavior of the non-abuser was so bad that it was a danger to put the kids there. And if we look at research that suggests the trend lines, we see the judges, guardians at litem, uh, family evaluators, uh, 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 my family court wizard folks are doing the darndest to do a better and better job to, to separate true from false claims of, of abuse true from false claims of parental alienation. And our research indicates that they need a pat on the back. Great. Well, this was uh, amazing. Thank you both for taking the time to be here today with us. Thank you for answering well, questions. And, and what I can mention is if anybody has uh, questions that we didn't have time for today um, that are related to this paper, <laughs> and some of the scientific questions or method questions, you can, uh, on Open Science Framework, there's an open area where questions can be posed. Um, like, so if you wanna know the meaning of this particular finding, um, you can pose them there and we will answer. And it is a public setting, so other people will see who posted and responded, but, but we want it to be open and transparent. And that's why we agreed to do this is part of the whole transparency in open science isn't just about doing the research in open way, but dissemination in an open, transparent way. And so, we're happy to answer questions in that venue where it's open and transparent and everybody can benefit from the answers and the, the, the questions that are posed. Um, so we encourage you to put them there. Yeah. Great. Thank you for thank you again. participating. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ashish. All right. <laughs> thank you, everyone. All right. And this is recorded too, I think, right? So, okay. Yeah, so thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>